Good evening uh, from uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, I just like to uh, start this uh, this uh, talk by asking everyone first to uh, let's take a like a, a break from uh, from looking at the screen. Just a brief break because uh, I know that you've been. You've been uh, you've been watching and listening to our very interesting speakers, uh, so I'd like you to uh, close your eyes, or if you're not comfortable with that, you may want to uh, uh, stare at another side of the room and stare at something soothing. And I'd like you to do something um, with me right now. And as you close your eyes, I'd like you to observe your breath. Okay. Just observe your breath for about 10, 10 to 15 seconds. Just observe your breath. And just be mindful of the air that enters your nostrils in. Uh, as it leaves your your body, just be mindful of that. And now I'd like you to still uh, anchoring on your breath. I'd like you to change your breathing to a relaxed mood and whatever relaxed means for you. So if, like, say, if you were had an image, for example, what would it look like, and then. You may want to focus on that for again, about 15 to 20 seconds. And with your eyes closed or staring at an object in the room and let's give it about 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, all right, so I hope that you're all uh, feeling uh, relaxed at this point. Uh, uh, bear with me because uh, this is going to be at least uh, 30 minutes of presentation. And uh, again, I'd like to greet you from, uh, from Ontario, Canada. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, 11.20 uh, in the evening in, in Ontario. Um, so, uh, uh, I'd like to begin this by, uh, let me just uh, share with you um, my presentation. Uh, just give me a sec. Okay, we'll get there. Okay. All right. So, so this morning's uh, presentation is about how we can deal with grief in the classroom. Um, and uh, I would just like to uh, say a few things here that uh, the ideas, uh, views, explanations expressed in the content of this webinar or this, this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, official policy or position any organization I am affiliated with. I do not have any affiliation with or involvement in any organization or entity with any financial interest or non-financial interest in the subject matter or materials discussed in this presentation. So I'd like uh, to give you a content warning that the following presentation includes a discussion of grief, factors that affect grief and other information related to death, trauma and loss that may be disturbing or distressing to some of you. So if you believe that this will be traumatizing for you or distressing, then you may choose to forego uh, attending this presentation. If the content uh, triggers uh, persist, causes further distress and you believe you need help, uh, I'd advise you to consult a mental health professional right away. 
I also like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands where I find myself today. Uh, in Canada, uh, whenever we make presentations, whether it's virtually or in person, we usually would do a land acknowledgement. Uh, uh, while I am meeting you in a virtual platform, I would like to acknowledge the importance of these lands where I make my home and do my work. And I do this to reaffirm my co commitment and responsibility to indigenous peoples and their cultures from coast to coast to coast. I'd like to invite everyone to join me in a moment of reflection, to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We just uh, had Pope Francis who visited Canada uh, for the past six days um, to apologize to the indigenous people. And uh, please consider how we can individually or collectively move forward in support of reconciliation, justice, and respectful collaboration. Okay, so uh, today's presentation, I'd just like to uh, I'll give you a brief outline. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the definition of grief. Uh, there is a brief involvement here from your end. Uh, I also like to um, uh, uh, offer some uh, developmental differences in understanding grief and some ways of managing grief through a developmental lens. Incidentally, uh, I just like to uh, mentioned that I was also a, a very active uh, teacher uh, or professor when teacher and professor when I was in the Philippines. And I also used to teach here in, uh, in Canada, um, but right now I am in, uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm doing private practice. Okay, so let's get into some definitions here for so what is grief? Um, let me um, ask you, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if you were to choose one word or emoticon to describe grief, what would it be? Okay. So um, I will give you a chance to um, do that and uh, let's see. You can type it. Okay. There's. All right. That's interesting. Normal, okay, loss, sadness. Okay, a lot of a lot of weeping. I don't know how to go. Painful, okay, loss. Thank you. Um, normal, okay. Heartbroken. Interesting, interesting. Uh, thank you for your responses. There's even a graph here: a black heart, pain. Intense longing, feeling blank and empty. Okay, that's very good. Okay, anger, right, pressure, longing, pain. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next question. Thank you for your participation. Um, so uh, let me ask you the next question this time. Um, so if you were to choose one object to describe grief, okay, uh, object, what would it be? So type the object in the chat box. And uh, again, I'll, I'll check out the responses here. Airplane, broken glass, knife. Ooh, okay. Broken mirror, dark room, Pandora's box, Pandora's box. Okay, uh, the canoe, I think there's a, Dark room, crumpled paper, empty space. There's a half glass, um, empty and half glass full, broken glass, coffin, broken heart, tears, alone swing, locked door, rock, debris. Interesting, black crayon, okay. Empty buckets of ball, broken heart. Okay, and a house and a broken heart. Masks, wings, lake, double-edged sword. Falling building, empty room, gravestone. Okay, um, is that a black ball, John? In the land, I don't. Okay, glass R, gray sky. Okay, uh, blood. Okay, interesting window. Okay, there's so much that I can see uh, from from what you're sharing. Okay, now you see that when you capture grief, there's so much as 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 you you actually. Uh, 
have responded to that question. Uh, this, this photo actually was taken, and this is something that I shared when I gave a, uh, a webinar uh, on grief uh, with the PAP as well. If you've attended it, you might see some of those slides coming in as well. But um, this actually photo was taken uh, during the pandemic when, uh, I, I'm not so sure if you heard it in the news in Nova Scotia, where there was a man who dressed up as a police and, and, and killed about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, more than uh, 15 people in a rampage. And that's, uh, that's a rare occurrence in that province, but it happened. And so people had to socially distance uh, themselves. This was during the first wave of the pandemic. And you can really see that this image uh, uh, clearly reflects what uh, people actually were, were experiencing. So there's the distancing, obviously because of the COVID at the time, but at the same time, you can see that the distance also that they feel probably uh, uh, and the fact that the hearse actually of those uh, more than 15 people uh, were buried on that day. Uh, let me just go through some definitions uh, of grief. As I said, I, I, I made you some of the slides uh, in my presentation from the webinar. Uh, nothing much has changed when it comes to the definition. Uh, as you can see that um, uh, the etymology of the word grief comes from the old French uh, grave, uh, which means to burden or uh, straining. Uh, I think some of you actually capture that in your emoticons or your, in, your, in your words. At the same time, in Tagalog, we have Lair Dalamhati or Hinaim. Cebuano uh, is Magpangotan, Magapasubo. Uh, I don't know if I... I got that right. Uh, and then uh, in French, I uh, have uh, chagrin and douleur. Um, the conceptual definitions, however, uh, do not stray much from how grief actually is defined. Uh, Miriam Webster defines grief as a deep or poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement, while uh, the APA dictionary uh, describes grief as an anguish experience after a significant loss, and usually this is after the death of a beloved person. We have to understand that when, when uh, we do grief work, uh, that the grief actually is, the grief work is not just the death of the person, as you will see later on, but all the other losses that is related to uh, to. To, to grief or to the person's experience in this case. Grief often includes physiological distress, um, separation anxiety, uh, confusion, yearning, obsessive dwelling on the past, and apprehension about the future. So there's that element of time, this past, and there's also that future element and also the present. At the same time, um, uh, grief can be, become so intense that it disrupts uh, one's function and immune system can sometimes even trigger suicidal thoughts. Uh, and grief may also take the form of regret for something lost, remorse, and so on. I usually, in, in my work, uh, grief work, one of the uh, frameworks that I use is that of uh, Sue Morris. Uh, and Sue Morris is a CBT uh, therapist. Uh, she has actually some free uh, PDF uh, workbooks on grief, which I can share. Uh, she described uh, grief as the intense emotional and physical reaction that someone experiences following the death of a loved one. And that there is usually deep sadness. There is an intense longing. I mentioned that earlier. And it is normal. Okay, I think one of you mentioned that too, that it's normal to, to grieve. Uh, the anguish experience after the loss, usually the death of a beloved person. And other forms of grief include, um, uh, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, there are other forms of grief, such as a job loss, uh, moving to another place. For example, when people move or immigrate, uh, they experience grief. So when I came to Canada, I actually, uh, um, experience grief and occasionally I, I still do. Uh, I'm sure that some of you can resonate with that, uh, losing a limb, retirement, and so on. 
So these are all uh, forms of grief. Uh, incidentally, the pandemic uh, uh, also elicited uh, grief-like symptoms uh, as, as you probably uh, have experienced it yourself. And there are, of course, other types of grief. Uh, you can take a look at all these words. Uh, you have complicated, you have, you have anticipatory, there's delayed, prolonged, and so on. Uh, perhaps one of the most popular uh, theories uh, uh, that was formulated uh, in terms of grief work is that of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, whose uh, uh, grief uh, stages of grief, uh, uh, she described it as, as uh, that, that grief actually comes in stages. Uh, recently, she revised this. Uh, uh, there is a revision of this uh, theory uh, together with another uh, uh, grief therapist. Uh, also recently, if you are familiar with uh, how grief and bereavement is defined now, especially if you look at the DSM-5 uh, TR, that grief actually is referred to as uh, occurring in waves. So it comes and goes, and over the time, it, intensity and frequency lessen over time, but can occur at any time often seem as though it happens out of the blue. And so usually there are what we refer to as triggers. Um, uh, trigger waves uh, usually are accompanied by intense emotions and can occur at any time. Uh, and so when we say uh, intense, it doesn't necessarily mean that when the, uh, the trigger waves happen again, that it is as intense as the first one. It appears to be intense, uh, uh, let alone that we need to uh, remember that uh, the experience of grief is subjective and it is complex and unique. Uh, and again, uh, just going back to how you describe grief uh, using emoticons or words, you can see how complex it is. So some actually even had emoticons uh, that probably were different from others, okay, uh, or or symbols or, or 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 objects that were different from from one another. So I think this is very important to remember. Sometimes we do forget this uh, in our own experience of grief and in other people's experience of grief. Um, it is unique, uh, as mentioned earlier. There are other factors that can affect grief. Your personality can affect how you grieve. Uh, cultural beliefs can affect how you grieve, the type of relationship you had with that person who died, uh, or the, the animal, in this case, some pets actually uh, uh, have very strong relationship with, with us. The way you think about things that happen in your life and the circumstances surrounding your death, the way you tend to deal with problems and other variables that have an impact on grief. So grief is not actually depression, but can move to depression depending on, on factors. At the same time, uh, there is no right or wrong in grief. So we, we often say in grief work that sad isn't bad. Recovery and adjustment also can take much longer. As I said earlier, that there are a lot of factors that can affect the way we cope with grief. Grief is also transient, so it's not something that stays on, as described earlier, it comes and then it goes. And the grief cannot be fit into a preordained time frame or form of expression. And too often, uh, people who experience a loss are disparaged because their mourning persists longer than others. And so we have to be careful with this because um, as what we said, um, each person's uh, experience of grief is unique. And so this has also some implications when it comes to dealing with grief when we see it amongst our students. So what could be those uh, developmental differences in understanding grief? Um, so let's look at some perspectives from students and teachers. Uh, um, I will be reading some of these perspectives based on firsthand accounts from students and also some teachers. Uh, I included also an experience of grief myself. So uh, I will start with the first one. So this comes from Hayden. Uh, this is based on a YouTube video that I, 
I saw uh, when I was preparing for this uh, presentation. So it goes, when I think about them, meaning the person who died, I feel happy and sad. Happy that you get to know them and have time with them. And it's sad when they go away when you're young. Most adults don't talk about grief and they're talking about different subjects rather than talk about that grief or talk about that subject. Okay, so that's uh, from Hayden, uh, who's seven years old. Let's move on to uh, Louis. So Louis actually is a former student of mine. Um, you can see how, uh, uh, where that was called. It was a book that I wrote uh, after uh, my volunteer year in Iloilo City. Uh, it says, uh, dear Lord, you know God for me, this day is very meaningful because I could not forget the death of my father, even if he had to die on my birthday. Yet I've come to realize that the greatest gift my father gave me was his own life. Uh, please take care of my father, Lord. And then there's Jeffrey, also a classmate of Louis, uh, uh, 16 years old. He said, dear Lord, I felt sad when the father of my classmate died. I know that Louis is or Louis is very sad because of this, but even though his father is dead, I still believe in the saying, in death comes life. We should not be afraid of death because all of us will eventually die. And this is me, uh, 24. Okay, so dear Lord, there was an unexplainable aura of grief the moment I entered the classroom. One of the students was slumped on his chair at the middle of my lecture. I asked one of his classmates to wake him up since the sight of him in deep slumber was offending me. When I left the room, one of my colleagues broke the news. Louis, the boy I reprimanded, was celebrating his birthday when his father died. I felt a certain lump in my throat and was also relieved that I did not unleash my ire when I saw him sleeping. However, there was a tinge of guilt for I never knew the real reason behind the student's silence. This is from Stuart, uh, who's in his 20s. Uh, my best friend's father died before she was born. Now that she's preparing to get married, she feels particularly lost without the father to give her away. And uh, this uh, is very recent again. I got this from YouTube. Uh, Irene Salinas is a teacher. Um, uh, she goes, uh, I didn't birth these children, but from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., Monday through Friday for 180 days, they were my babies. I apologize if my house is cluttered and disarray, but I am cluttered and disarray. I'm making cupcakes for Alithia's family. This is the least I can do for her. I always tell them I'll give my life to them. If I knew it was the last time, I would have hugged them tighter. It's not just bring the kids and move on. We're beyond shattered. Those kids had the future. Those kids had someone. They were loved by many. They will always be known. That's from Irene Salinas. Our, uh, the Ovalde uh, shootings uh, just happened very recently. Okay. So uh, now uh, maybe we can uh, take a deep breath first and let it go. After hearing that, you can, if you want to take a deep breath first and let, let it go. And one more. Okay. All right. So now what were the recurring themes here um, that uh, we actually, uh, uh, would have seen uh, at least based on what was uh, what was uh, said. Okay, so one is that you, you notice that there was those mixed emotions. As we defined grief earlier, we said that uh, there's it's it's unique, and at the same time, it's it's actually um, you know you have mixed emotions uh, as you can see, and this is also something true to your own experience. And then uh, notice also that there's a lot of retelling, reminiscing, remembering, recalling, and reframing. So one, one uh, Jeffrey mentioned uh, in death comes life. Uh, Louis said that uh, he gave his life to me. Uh, uh, that's the best that he actually received on his birthday. Um, there is also an acknowledgement of the feelings. Uh, there is a newfound meaning 
uh, there's also some insights and some realizations. It seems to be like a, uh, something that uh, we see all the time, uh, especially when when the death of the loved one has been there for, uh, you're still grieving, but then um, it's been a while since you probably talked about it. Or, and there's also rituals uh, to cope. So um, Ms. Ava, the, the Salinas, Ms. Salinas uh, actually uh, made some cupcakes uh, uh, for, for uh, Alethea's um, family. Okay, so uh, then how do we manage grief through uh, developmental lens? So when I see developmental here, uh, I'm looking at students who are younger and older. Um, and these are just uh, some ways of uh, managing grief uh, using a developmental lens. So, so we have to remember, by the way, that um, there are three components that each need to be addressed here. So uh, loss, change, and control. So these are the three uh, components that we need to address when one is grieving. Okay, so as teachers, um, you may be asking, how do I do that? I'm not a therapist, I'm a teacher. So how do I, how do I manage these three components, um, loss, change, and control? Okay, so first things first, uh, that the expression of loss uh, usually is less frequent in children, in children uh, than, than adults or than older children. Uh, their capacity to sit with their grief and talk about it may be limited or expressed differently. Uh, the, feel, the feelings of upset may be shorter, then it may appear as no longer there. But that doesn't mean that uh, they're no longer grieving. So recall that loss may be an abstract event for the child, so allowing the child to communicate their thoughts and feelings is very important. Second is that it's important to calm the child's fears without minimizing their emotions. So just be honest when responding to their concerns. Uh, it's okay to admit you don't know the answers. Just and be patient, be nurturing, and be consistent. The word consistent here is very important because when, when you're grieving, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that loss, change, and control, that the... Uh, uh, the person, whether the person is a young child or an older child or, or a teacher, uh, all experience that, according to Morris, that loss of control or that loss, change, and control. Control is an issue that, especially in the pandemic, when uh, I was seeing some clients and that uh, they have this perception that the they didn't have any control over anything at all. So um, the consistency is very important, especially with uh, when, when, when uh, dealing with grief. Encourage conversations, play, and physical outlets with symbolic activities using drawings and stories. It's relevant to check if children have any customs or rituals that they are familiar with. So you can use this as a springboard to discuss how death and grief is dealt with. Uh, for older children, you can do a needs assessment to find out what they're feeling and needing. Um, allow them to express their grief in a safe space to process feelings. Suspend your judgment. Try to be concrete with your answers. Again, there's that perception of uh, loss of control. Uh, so concrete answers, uh, big answers sometimes can make them more anxious, uh, but concrete answers will help. Build trust and adjust your expectations to their needs. Okay, so these are some examples of managing loss, change, and control. So you can do a body map to make sense of how their emotional and mental states translate to physical stress and tension in the body. Have them lay on a large piece of paper and outline their body shape with a marker so you can use a manila paper and then let them mark up the paper to show her and how they feel their emotions. And then you can, you can talk about it. This is a very um, interesting example uh, of managing loss, change, and control, which is uh, a grief puzzle. You can do this for both uh, 
children and um, adolescents, younger children and adolescents, and even for, for, for young adults as well. You may want to set aside time each week or every two weeks. Uh, this gives them a sense of control and allows them to reconstruct and reframe their grief experience. For younger children, you can use a grief puzzle like a ritual. Okay, so how do you do that? Uh, you can cut a large piece of paper to puzzle pieces, so make sure that everyone has at least one puzzle piece in the class. Choose which prompt from below you would like to represent your puzzle. So for example, grief is, if grief were a building or if grief were an object, using pictures, drawings, designs, or words, color your puzzle piece to represent your answers to the prompt. And when everyone has completed their puzzle piece, you assemble the puzzle together and take turns sharing about your different experiences. So these are some of the puzzle prompts. If grief was a color, if grief was a song, if grief was an animal, if grief was a flavor, and so on. For older children, um, you can encourage the creation of a grief time. Um, some people have what we refer to as a celebration of life. Okay, so this allows them to maintain a connection with their loved ones. So sometimes uh, some older children maybe and adults are focused on uh, what happened right before the person passed away, but they don't focus on what were the uh, events that happened before they got sick or before they passed away, not leading to the death, but say uh, celebrations and so on. Uh, you may want to focus on that and uh, then allow uh, the, the students to be creative with their grief time. Ask them to write a letter, create a scrapbook, they can prepare a favorite sandwich, a dish if they can, big favorite cookies of the loved one or play a game. So uh, one, one student, for instance, of mine uh, played Monopoly uh, with the family and this is the favorite game of uh, the mother who passed away. And uh, so they were talking about how mom actually uh, enjoyed playing Monopoly, although it Brought were, uh, you know, they were crying, but they still enjoyed um, playing uh, Monopoly because it, it allowed them to be more relaxed uh, when it came to managing their grief time. Okay, you can also use uh, movies or video clips to talk about grief for younger children. So I'd like to share, uh, can I do that? Uh, can I share, uh, that, that can, I'll just share sound, right? So, um, yes, okay, I can share that. Okay, uh, there's an ad here, so I uh, just bear with me for so. Okay, I need to share the sound, I think, right? So just share the sound. Okay. Um, there's still an ad. The history of Quebec City is still very much alive. Quebec City is an open air museum. Okay, what? all right. The Heart and the Bottle by Oliver Jeffers. Once there was a girl, much like any other, whose head was filled with all the curiosities of the world. With thoughts of the stars. With wonder at the sea. She took delight in finding new things. Until the day she found an empty chair. Feeling unsure, the girl thought the best thing was to put her heart in a safe place, just for the time being. So she put it in a bottle and hung it around her neck. And that seemed to fix things, at first. 
Although, in truth, nothing was the same. She forgot about the stars and stopped taking notice of the sea. She was no longer filled with all the curiosities of the world and didn't take much notice of anything other than how heavy and how awkward the bottle had become. But at least her heart was safe. It might never have occurred to the girl what to do had she not met someone smaller and still curious about the world. There was a time when the girl would have known how to answer her, but not now, not without her heart. And it was right at that moment she decided to get it back out of the bottle. But she didn't know how. She couldn't remember. And nothing seemed to work. The bottle couldn't be broken. It just bounced and rolled. Right down to the sea. But there... It occurred to someone smaller and still curious about the world that she might know a way. And it just so happened. She did. The heart was put back where it came from. And the chair wasn't so empty anymore. But the bottle was. And that's the end of the story. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, go back to the slide again. I just very quickly. Okay. Just give me a sec. Okay. Okay. So, um, so some examples. Uh, other examples is to how to manage the firsts. You may involve the child with the preparation of a framework. Uh, uh, preparate, sorry, uh, with the preparation. Uh, a useful framework would be uh, Morris's. Uh, framework that comes in for so manage anticipation plan the predictables first uh, first birthday develop plans no matter how they simple they are who would you like to invite what arrangements do you need to make ahead of time develop realistic expectations and find ways to incorporate memories of your loved ones and what they mean to you again uh, you can tweak it um, according to what is more appropriate uh, but I think that managing the first also is very important in terms of like being aware of, uh, of, of the, like the loved one's birthday and so on. This um, creating a memory lantern again is, is very interesting. This is very similar to the grief puzzle, only that um, the teacher actually can come up with uh, cutouts from um, and, and use and, and paste it on a big jar and put the lead light so that uh, you can actually see uh, that the, the, the lantern or the memory lantern that the, the, the children can actually see uh, representations of what grief is, okay. Uh, grief uh, triggers may occur anytime. So you need to set up a safety plan. Uh, work out a signal to communicate when this happens. So make a plan where the student can go and who they can talk with. If they know they will be able to leave and they will often feel less overwhelmed and more likely to stay in class. Um, and then um, finally, these are some insights from Dr. Kerndam uh, in her classic book, uh, uh, Filipino Children Under Stress. Um, she cites that death in the family can change relationship dynamics that parents should facilitate communication of thoughts and feelings of their children to avoid feeling trapped. We mentioned this earlier that it's important that um, children are allowed to communicate thoughts and feelings. The most vulnerable and sensitive among the family 
usually feel the brunt and carry the burden. Ideally, the family should go through the mourning process together and rituals and prayers help them feel family togetherness. Okay, so I'd like to end um, my presentation today with um, this poem by the chimney uh, by William Blake and the title is Chimney Sweeper. So it goes, when my mother died, I was very young and my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep and in suit I sleep. There's little Tom Dacre who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, hush Tom, never mind it for when you, your head's bare, you know that the suit cannot spoil your white hair. And so he was quiet and that very night as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned and Jack were all of them locked up in coffins of black. And by came an angel who had a bright key and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down the green plain, leaping, laughing, they run and wash in a river and shine in the sun. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise upon clouds in sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom he'd be a good boy. He'd have God for his father and never want joy. And so Tom awoke and he rose in the dark and got with her bags and her brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Thank you. Uh, Maraming salamat po. Masibuku. Uh, Dakala salamat po.